Well, good morning, everyone. If I could just draw those conversations to a close. It is great to see you all. Aren't Baptism Sundays absolutely amazing? Just so incredible to hear those. Yeah, let's give God another round of applause for all he's doing, for all he's done. It's just so encouraging to hear those stories. I, I love it. Um, it's so good to see you, you know, as Andy said, especially if this is your first time here, perhaps you're here for the baptisms or you're just visiting us. Uh, my name's James. I'm part of the senior leadership team here. And before we dive into the Bible together, I just want to remind some of you or let some of you know for the first time about something really exciting that's coming up later this year, which is the Catalyst Festival. So our family of churches is getting to way together, getting to getting our way together. Sorry, I stumbled there. For four days at the end of August, a bank holiday weekend at the end of August, 26th to 29th, for a festival full of worship, teaching, great stuff for kids and young people, uh, stuff in the arts and in music, sport, all sorts of stuff going on. And we're going to get to spend four days together as a church family, enjoying God, building community. It's going to be really, really good. And we'd love it if kind of we went as a whole church family, if as many people as possible from City Church can be there. And if you want to come, the best time to book in is before the end of March because there is a price break moment. Um, you can find out all the details on the, on, through our website. It'll take you to the booking page for Catalyst. Um, we would love to see you there. So please do get booked in. Please do start having those conversations about how you're going to make kind of summer work so you can be there. I would love to be there together with all of you. So for the last six weeks, if you've been around, you will know we have been exploring together a book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was originally written as a letter to a church in a place called Corinth in the first century. It was written by a guy called Paul. We sometimes call him the Apostle Paul, who had helped start that church. And he's writing to them to tell them and teach them what it looks like to live as God's holy people. To be holy just means to be set apart, to be different, to be kind of called out to live in a different way to the rest of the world. So he's writing them to say, now you are followers of Jesus and now you as a community are following Jesus together. What should your lives look like? What does it look like to live as someone who's holy, who's set apart for God? And we're going to finish this series today by talking about one incredibly important aspect of what it means to live a life set apart for God. We're going to talk about what it looks like to live a life full of God's love. What does it mean to live a life full of love for God and love for one another in this special, amazing way that God calls us into? And to help us do that, we're going to read from a really well-known passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I wonder if we could stand together as we read God's Word and as I pray for us. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul writes this, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom, fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 
And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the beauty and power of these words. And we just invite you here, God, by your Holy Spirit to come and have your way. We want to grow in our understanding of your love for us, and we want to grow in our love for others. So come and speak to us, encourage us, challenge us, stir us. We come together as your holy people this morning to see you and learn from you. Come and speak to us, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats again, guys. You know, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, if you've ever been to a wedding where there have been readings from Scripture, you might have heard these words before. Uh, They're words that are often used at weddings as a kind of way of giving advice to husbands and wives, how to love each other well. Be patient, be kind, don't keep a record of wrongs. And you know, whilst these words might have some great advice for all of us in all of our relationships, they're not actually written about kind of romantic love or the love between a husband and a wife at all. These verses are actually about a very particular kind of love. And what makes it a bit challenging is is we use that word love in English for so many different things, don't we? So we'll talk about loving, you know, we might say, I love you, mum. And then we might also say, I love pizza. And hopefully we're talking about something a little bit different or our, you know, mums are going to feel a little bit shortchanged, aren't they? We use the word love. It's quite a broad word. It's quite a sloppy word, quite a general word. But in the ancient Greek language that this letter was originally written in and the whole of the New Testament was written in, there are actually four different words for love. They all get translated as love when we read our Bibles, but there's actually four different words. Storge, philia, eros, and agape. You know, storge is the kind of love between family members. It's that kind of instinctive bond, maybe, between a parent and a child. Philia is, is the love of friendship, a love between friends, a more, a more kind of chosen bond of affection and loyalty between people. Eros, romantic love, sexual love, where we get our word erotic from. But, you know, the word used in 1 Corinthians 13 The kind of love this passage is talking about is this fourth kind of love, agape love. It's talking about the highest form of love. Agape love is the love that God has for us. It's the kind of love he calls us to have for one another. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that's not first and foremost based on how you feel, a kind of instinctive affection or attraction towards somebody. It's a love we choose to step into as we reflect on God's love for us and as we seek to model that to one another. It's an active love. It's a a doing kind of love rather than an emotion. And this passage is an appeal to live a life marked by the kind of love God has for us. And the words were originally written to a church, to a group of Christian believers who were in a bit of a mess when it came to this stuff. You know, the church in Corinth was actually an incredibly gifted church. There were lots of people with amazing gifts, spiritual gifts, talents, but they were arguing all the time. There was loads of division. They were falling out. And in the midst of that, they'd lost the one thing that mattered most. They were losing their love. They were losing their love for God and they were losing their love for one another. And so Paul writes these words to them and he says, hang on, hang on, Corinthians, doesn't matter if you have some amazing gift, like you can speak in tongues in an amazing way or you can prophesy. It doesn't matter if you're really clever or you have amazing wisdom and discernment and insight into situations. It doesn't matter if you have incredible faith, believe God can do great things and want to rally people to that vision. If you don't have love, all that giftedness is just like empty noise to God. It's a clanging symbol. It doesn't matter if you're super passionate about social issues and the poor and social justice. If in the midst of that you lose your love for God and for people, it's worthless. It doesn't matter if you're working super hard, you're pouring your life out, you're a bit of a martyr, you're giving yourself to the things of God. Without love, it's a waste of time. 
And you know, I believe these words are as relevant for us today as they were for the Corinthian church back then. As we seek to be God's holy people, as we seek to live a life that's pleasing to him. In fact, I want to suggest to you guys today that there are kind of two equal and opposite pitfalls and traps we can fall into as we seek to live a life full of God's love. The first kind of pitfall we can fall into is that it's possible to be following God, but losing your love. Following God, but losing your love. We can be people who want to follow God, who want to live for God, who want to live in a way that glorifies God, but in the process, we can lose our love for him and we can lose our love for one another. That's what was happening in Corinth, right? They were seeking to follow God and be spiritual and do the right things, but they were losing their love for one another. Some of them were super passionate about spiritual gifts. And, you know, this amazing thing had happened after Jesus had rose again and ascended. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the people of God and they began to have these incredible supernatural spiritual gifts. But they become so fixated on these gifts and how they should be expressed and kind of whether they should be allowed to use them here or there that their love for one another had grown cold. Some of them were full of vision and faith. They could see how amazing the church could be, what an impact it could have. And yet in that place of faith and vision, they'd stop loving one another. The people had become kind of obstacles to the great vision of God. Some of them were all about the poor, compassion for the marginalized. But in the process, ironically, they become pretty unloving towards one another. Some of them were always working, always serving, always giving. They were tired and worn out. But you know what? With a, with a kind of badge of pride, they said, we're tired and worn out because we're doing things for God and we're extending his kingdom. But they'd lost the most important thing. They'd lost their love for God and for his people. And you know what? We need to feel the full weight of God's words here. He says that all of the spiritual gifts, all of the faith, all of the care for the poor, all of the hard work means what? Not not means a little, means nothing without love. Not, you know, it's a bit suboptimum, but it's okay, but maybe work a little bit harder on your kind of love for people. No, it means nothing without love. Even if it looks successful, even if it looks impressive, even if you're going for it, without love, it's nothing. And if you're looking for signs in your life of when maybe you're drifting into this place of losing this kind of love for God and for others, the passage gives us some quite good warning signs because it talks about what love does look like and what love doesn't look like. It says love is patient and love is kind and love looks like protecting people and trusting people and being full of hope and being someone of perseverance. But it says it doesn't look like envy. It doesn't look like feeling the need to boast, to get our way, to let other people know what we're doing or how significant we are. It doesn't look like getting angry. It doesn't look like gossiping. It doesn't look like dishonoring other people, speaking badly of other people. It doesn't look like holding on to grudges or kind of keeping a mental list of all the ways somebody's wronged you. I wonder how you're doing when it comes to this stuff in your life. Because this stuff really matters to God. This passage tells us, you know, all the other stuff doesn't really matter if this love, this life of love for me and for others is not in place. And it's possible to lose it, even in the midst of trying to serve and honor and glorify God with our lives. You know, I'm really aware of this in my own life. In, In so many ways, this is a great season in the life of our church, celebrating people getting baptized and seeing lots of areas of the life of the church flourishing and growing. But in the busyness of that and in the activity of that and the vision of that and the hard work of that, it's possible to begin to lose your love for God and for other people. And for me, you know, as I look at that passage in those list of words, I spot the warning signs in my own life. For me, usually in ways nobody else would see, but it's there under the surface. It's, I begin to get a bit less patient with people. I begin to feel a bit more angry about things. I begin to feel a bit less kind of hopeful about situations and people than usual. I don't know what it is for you, but if you resonate with this sense of following God 
but losing your love along the way. I just want to encourage you to do three things. Firstly, we're going to be people who take responsibility. Your first responsibility in life is to love God and to love people with this kind of agape love of God. Matthew 22, people came to Jesus and they said to him, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing in the law? What is this life living for God really all about? And Jesus answered like this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, and otherwise, in other words, everything God's about hangs on these two commandments. Loving God and loving people is everything. If anything else is getting in the way of that, we have to take responsibility for it in our own lives. That might be unforgiveness that we're holding on to towards somebody else. It might be busyness. It might be your passion for a particular area of ministry or kind of spiritual life. But if it's drawing us away from love for God and love for other people, we need to deal with that ruthlessly because none of it really matters if it isn't underpinned by that love for God and love for others. You know, in taking responsibility, that might look like, you know, saying sorry to somebody where it, even if it's in, just in your own heart, the relationship hasn't been marked by that love. Taking responsibility might be putting some things down that you're carrying. They might even be really good things, but they're taking you away from this life of love. Taking responsibility might just look like kind of doing business with God this morning and asking for him to restore this kind of love to your life in a new way. You're going to take responsibility is the first thing. Second thing, you're going to choose to love. Because, you know, as I said before, this kind of agape love, this, this love is not like that kind of family bond or that friendship bond. It's a love we choose. It's not a natural disposition. It's not affection. It's unrealistic that we're going to feel that towards everyone all the time. But we can choose to walk in this love. We can choose kindness. We can choose patience. We can put on the love of God. We can decide to prefer the needs of others. We can decide to lay down our lives for others. We're going to choose to love. And third thing, we're going to ask for God's help. You know, the good news is our God is a God of love who has an infinite resource of this kind of love that he loves to pour out on us. So when I find myself growing impatient, growing angry, growing a bit less hopeful, I can come to God and I can say, look, I can't muster this love in and of myself, God. It's not natural to me, but it's natural to you. Would you fill me with more of your spirit? Would you help me, whether it's with my family or my friends or in ministry or whatever it might be, to walk in your way of love? I need you, God. We're going to take responsibility. We're going to choose to love. We're going to ask for God's help. We're going to not become those people who follow God, but in the process lose our love for him and for one another. And you know, if this resonates with you, I want to encourage you later on to come and get ministry. Come and ask people to pray for you. I hope you see in this passage the seriousness of being people who love God and love others and the seriousness of asking for God's help when we need it. But I said earlier, you know, that's one of these pitfalls we can fall into as we seek to live a life of God's love. But there's another one, kind of an equal and opposite pitfall we can fall into. And that's we can become people who are worshipping love and losing God. We can follow God and lose love, but we can also worship love and lose God. Let me explain. You know, one of the most beautiful phrases in the Bible but one which I think often gets misunderstood or misapplied is found in 1 John 4 verse 16, which says, God is love. You know, such a beautiful, powerful phrase captures so much of what we're talking about this morning, this idea that right at the heart of who God is and what he's called us to be, a people full of love, agape love. But the reason I say I think this verse can be misunderstood or misapplied or distorted is because what many people effectively do is kind of read it and understand it the other way around as saying love is God rather than God is love. 
And that might sound like kind of semantics or nitpicking, but actually it really matters. Because if we say and believe that love is God, what we end up actually doing is kind of taking our definition of love and applying it to God and saying, this is what God must be like. This is what God's love must be like. We take our definition of love and we put it onto the message of the Christian faith and the teachings of scripture. And we say, this is what following God must look like. When what we should be doing is looking to God and letting him define what agape, true, life-transforming love is, not the other way around. The problem with starting with my definition of love, what I feel about love and imposing it upon God is that my definition of love is always going to be a bit broken, a bit distorted, a bit fallen. There's going to be good bits of it and there's going to be bad bits of it because we live in a fallen world and actually the fact that we don't really know how to love properly is the reason the world's in the mess that it's in. The agape love of God The love that changes lives, the love that changes the world is not something we can find anywhere else but in God. And when we start imposing our distorted version of love upon God, we end up distorting who God is. And we end up distorting what his good news is. It's down that road we end up saying, well, it doesn't seem very loving to me for God to be holy. It doesn't seem very loving to me that God would care how people live their lives. It doesn't seem very loving to me that there's going to be a judgment one day and that salvation really matters and that there's heaven and that there's hell. It doesn't seem very loving to me for the Bible to say this or that. It doesn't seem loving to me for Christians to ever live in a way which might upset or offend anyone ever. Because I'm taking my broken, distorted, fallen version of love and I'm insisting that that's the way God must be. And that's the way the gospel must be. We end up watering down the character of God, watering down the gospel and making them kind of toothless and ineffective. At best, we might end up being kind of broadly, vaguely empathetic, compassionate people, but essentially indistinguishable from the world around us and unable to bring real transformation, which comes when we let God define what love is. And God define how lives are going to really get changed. You know, ironically, if we worship love, we end up not really loving anyone. Not with the kind of love of God that can really change lives and really change the world. But if we let God define love, if we let God define his kind of love, it's a different story. Because what sits right at the heart of God's love The Bible tells us repeatedly, here's an example, 1 John 4, verse 9 to 10. The same verse we read, God is love. It defines it for us, God's kind of love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What does God's love look like? It looks like Jesus coming into the world to die for our sin, to deal with all the stuff that separates us from God. You know, that phrase, atoning sacrifice, might sound religious or confusing to you, but it basically means a sacrifice needed to be made for us to access and know the love of God. A price needed to be paid for our brokenness, for our fallenness, for our sin, for the way every single one of us in different ways has chosen to reject God and live our own way. But in Jesus, God himself has come and paid the price and made a way for us to know the love of God. And I don't know if you can see here that actually if we embrace the kind of love is God mindset, Ultimately, the very message of the gospel will become offensive to us because the message of the gospel says you are a sinner who needs saving. And that is a message which is always going to be something which causes offense to the world. But it's also the power of God for salvation. It's also the hope for the world. It's all we have to offer. The love of God expressed in the cross of Jesus for sinners. 
If we want to change the world, if we want to really show people a love that can transform lives, we must be those who don't lose our love as we seek to follow God, but we must also be those who worship and submit our whole lives to God, not kind of general ideas of love and niceness and kindness, but to the God who is love, to the God who showed his love for us by coming in the person of Christ and dying for our sins. You know, and I know there might be some people here today, you're so welcome if this is you, who's never responded to God's love, who's never said yes to this message that Jesus died for you in order that you might know the love of God. Or you're not sure if you've ever done that, or you've never kind of taken that conclusive step of saying yes to that. You know, you need to know that God loves you so much. He loves you with a love that is so different and so much better than that you might know real love, a love that is always going to be patient, a love that is always going to be kind, a love that never fails a love that keeps no record of wrongs. You might come into church today very aware that there's a long record of wrongs in your life. You know, the Bible says when you trust in Jesus, your sins are removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Isn't it amazing? God knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you know about yourself, and yet he still chooses to love you, to die for you. And it wouldn't be loving of me not to appeal to you today and say, we're all sinners who need saving. But when we accept Jesus, we go from being lost and broken to being found and made whole. And all we need to do is say yes to Jesus and his sacrifice for us upon the cross. I want to give all of us an opportunity, whether that's us or whether we followed Jesus for many years to respond to the love of God this morning. I wonder if we could stand and I think the band are going to come back up. Let's stand together. You know, this is, this is serious stuff. Living lives full of the love of God. This passage tells us nothing else really matters. So I just want to encourage you right now to just bow your head Close your eyes and just open up your heart to God coming and speaking to you about this right now. Let's just be still in his presence. There's a moment in the book of Revelation when Jesus is speaking to different churches, to different groups of Christians. And there's one group of people, he says... You know, I see your hard work. I see your faithfulness. I see the way you've been striving to live for me. But then he says, there's one thing I've got against you. You've forsaken your first love. Your love for me, your love for others. And it's quite chilling because he says, if you don't return to that place of love, I'm going to come. And it's this image of removing a lampstand, which is a picture of removing his presence, removing his goodness, removing his blessing. Again, it's this message. The only thing that really matters is not the busyness, is not the activity, is not the spiritual gifts, is not even the mission and care to the poor. All of that needs to flow out of a place of love, agape love for me and for others. Come back to that place of first love. And it might be for you today that you know that love has grown a bit cold. You might recognize some of those warning signs from the passage about your own love. Maybe even amidst trying to follow God, it's grown cold. Maybe even amidst being super passionate about an area of ministry or spiritual life. Maybe amidst the sense of faith and vision and frustration that the church isn't where it should be. Maybe amidst a care for people or of working really hard. There's a sense that love has grown cold and and God's saying to you today, come back to that place of first love. You know, if you recognise any of that, why don't you just hold open your hands before you as I pray? Hold open your hands as a sign of receiving more of the love of God. Holy Spirit, come and fill us with your abundant, incredible, life-transforming love. The love that sent Jesus to the cross to die 
for the sins of the world. Come and fill us afresh with your love. Whisper to each one of us now of your great love for us and of specific ways you're calling us back to live lives of love for you. You know, it's a beautiful thing when we take steps to get back to that place of first love, even if those steps are painful, even, even if those steps are opening up to somebody and getting them to pray for you, even if that step is saying you know, to someone, you know, sorry, I haven't been living this way towards you. Even if those steps are laying things down that are good things, but they're taking you away from that place of love for God. Just resolve in your heart now what you're gonna do if you need to do something to come back to that place of first love. For others, God just wants to reveal more of his love to us. It's great as we've been praying as a team this morning. Uh, My friends Dave and Louie were sharing words they felt God was speaking over us. My friend Dave said he felt, felt there were people here who were just struggling with loneliness. Again, if that's you, just open up your hands before you. God wants you to know you are loved. And you are loved with something that is better than any solution to loneliness this world can offer. You are loved with the deep, rich love of God. And Louis felt that God wanted to reveal his love to three different groups of people. People who were just saying yes to God for the first time, beginning that journey. People who've been following him a while, but they need something restored in terms of that deep love of God. And those who perhaps are aware that their journey of following Jesus in this life is kind of drawing towards an end, but God just wants to remind you again of his abundant, incredible love. Guys, we're going to worship together now. I just want to encourage you, you know, this stuff really, really, really matters. And it happens with a drift. It happens over time. Our love grows cold. If any of that resonates with you, even as we begin to worship, you don't have to wait for the end of the service. Our ministry team over here to my right, your left, would love to pray with you about any of this stuff. A sense of love growing cold, something you know you've got to do in response to this call to love, wanting to know more of God's love yourself, maybe even responding to God's love for the first time this morning. If that's you, do come out and receive prayer. For the rest of us, let's press in to this place of worship. Let's express our love for God as we sing together. Let's do that now.